Hello, today we're continuing with our GCSE physics revision series looking at half-life. A half-life is the time for half of a radioactive substance to decay and it can vary from less than a second to billions of years. But here's the important point, after the half-life time you always have half left. So let me explain one common error. People assume that if you have one kilogram of radioactive material and you wait for a half-life, half-life is measured in time, so you wait for a certain amount of time which is the half-life, that means by definition that after the half-life you will have half a kilogram of that material because the definition of a half-life is the time for half of it to decay. Now what they then think is if you wait another half-life you'll have nothing. That is not true. What of course it means is you always have half left. So if you start with one kilogram and you wait for a half-life then you'll have a half a kilogram. That's fine. If you wait for another half-life you'll have a quarter of a kilogram because you'll have a half of what you had before. And if you wait for another half-life, you'll have an eighth of a kilogram. And another half-life will get you a sixteenth of a kilogram. So you see, you're never going to get strictly to zero because you're always going to have half of what you had before. Now, as I explained in a previous video, if you have some radioactive material, which is, of course, full of unstable atoms, all of which wish to decay, I told you that if you pick any given atom, let's take that one, and you say when will that atom decay, there is no way of knowing. It doesn't matter whether you know the half-life or not, you still can't tell whether that particular atom will decay. All you can say is that on average a half of them will decay in the half-life, which we usually write as t to the half. So half of them will decay and half of them won't in the half-life. But which ones decay, you have no way of knowing. In fact, it's rather interesting to think, how do the atoms know which ones are going to decay? I mean, if there are several billion, somehow someone's got to organise it to say, well, you half, you can decay, you half, you can't decay. Somehow, nature manages this all on its own. So it's a statistical thing. When you've got billions of atoms, statistically, half of them will decay in the half-life, but you can never tell which ones are going to decay. One atom might decay instantly. Another atom might still be around after ten half-lives. Now we've already said that the decay of an atom is associated with the emission of either an alpha or a beta or gamma radiation. So you can measure that, you can count the number of this type of radiation that's being emitted. And that's called the count rate or the activity of the sample. Now the more cells, sorry, the more atoms that decay the more radiation you're going to get. So consequently, what you would expect is at the beginning of the half-life you, you would get a certain level of activity, that is a certain number of decays measured by the radiation that's coming off. But after the half-life, where you've only got a half of them left, you would expect that the activity or the amount of radiation that's coming off would also halve. So the count rate is essentially a measure of the number of atoms that are decaying. So let's do an exam question. Let's take a substance which is emitting 640 counts per minute. That is to say we are measuring either alpha or beta or gamma radiation and we're getting 640 counts per minute. And then after two hours, so two hours goes by, We are now measuring only 80 counts per minute. 
And the question will be, what is the half-life? Now, the best way of doing this is just to do it in stages. So what you would say is you start with 640. And after the first half-life, what would you expect? Well, you would expect the count rate to halve. That's the definition. So it will be 320. After the next half-life, you would expect the activity to halve again. So now it will be 160. And after the next half-life, you would expect it to halve again, and now it will be 80, which is what you were given. So it took one, two, three half lives to get from 640 down to 80. But the total time was two hours. So the half life, since three half lives are two hours, a single half life is two hours, which is of course 120 minutes, divided by three periods, which is 40 minutes. So the half life was 40 minutes. After the first 40 minutes, you halved. After the second 40 minutes, you halved again. And after the third 40 minutes, you halved again to the rate that you were given. We can plot decay on a graph. Here we will measure the counts per minute that we record from the radioactive decay. And here we'll measure the time in seconds. What you do is you measure the counts per minute when you start and then you measure the counts per minute at regular intervals and you plot them on the chart. And what you will find is you will get a curve that looks something like that. And you can now deduce the half-life because the half-life is the time for the activity to halve. So if that's the activity, you need to find the halfway point and then go to the curve and that time there is the half-life because it was the time taken, that's what we're measuring, for half, for, or rather for the activity to halve. But of course you can check it because if you now halve it again, this too is the half-life because it's the time taken for the activity here to halve. And you can do it again. Halfway, across, I've not drawn it very well, but that too is the half-life because it was the time taken for the activity to fall from here to here. So this is a way of measuring half-life. The activity or the counts per minute, sorry, I should have said counts per second. We have been using counts per minute up to now, but the strict way we measure activity is in counts per second, and one count per second is called a Becquerel. After Henri Becquerel, who was the physicist who um, gives his name to this particular measure. So a Becquerel is essentially one decay per second. So if you've got a hundred atoms decaying in one second, that is a hundred Becquerels. And this can measure alpha, beta or gamma at rays or emissions. So a Becquerel is one emission per second. Just to give you some idea of what might be causing this, let's take for example radium which has 88 protons and 226 protons and neutrons. That is unstable and decays into the gas radon which has 86 protons and 222 protons and neutrons, plus an alpha particle, which of course has two protons and four protons and neutrons. This of course is just the helium nucleus, as we've said before. So this is the process by which one decay of a radium atom into a radon atom generates an alpha particle. So every decay generates an alpha particle. Or we can go back to the formula we've seen before where we take radioactive carbon, which is carbon-14, and that we saw before decays into nitrogen, which is of course stable, plus a beta particle, which has minus one charge but no protons and neutrons, plus as I've said before, this um, 
anti-neutrino, which we don't need to worry too much about. But here was the point that the unstable carbon atom decays into a stable nitrogen atom, but it gives off a beta particle. So every beta particle that is emitted has come from one atom decaying. Incidentally, I should have just mentioned that when radium deca decays to radon, radon is still radioactive. So that will then decay into something else. But the point I'm making with these equations is that if you measure the radiation that comes off, that will tell you how many cells, or sorry, how many atoms have decayed. So you get one alpha particle for every decay. Here you get one beta particle for every decay. And that means that if we draw our graph with our activity up the side, which we're now going to measure in becquerels, and our time in seconds, and if we start here, and after 10 seconds we find that we've got half left, and then after another 10 seconds we find we've got half of that, and after another 10 seconds we've got half again, and then after another 10 seconds, we've got half again. That is our half-life. The half-life every 10 seconds means that the activity has halved. So we went from there to there in the first 10 seconds. We went from there to there in the next 10 seconds. We went from there to there in the next 10 seconds. The activity is always halved in 10 seconds. That means the number of decays has halved in 10 seconds, which means that 10 seconds is the half-life. And half-lives need to be taken into account. For example, if you're using radioactive material in a medicinal setting, you want a short half-life. Because you, if you're injecting someone with radioactive material, you want a very short half-life so that by the end of the day, to all intents and purposes, it has all decayed and there's no longer any danger inside you. You don't want to be stuck with something that will take years to decay because then you've got radioactive material inside you, which is no good. Even when the radioactive material is inside you for a short period, it's still capable of doing damage. But of course, you have to weigh up the pros and cons. The reason that you will be injected with some radioactive material is to either identify what's wrong with you or maybe to try and cure you and you just have to take the additional risk of having radioactive material inside you in order to get the benefit. But a short half-life means effectively by the end of the day, certainly within a couple of days, to all intents and purposes the uh, radioactive material will have decayed. So within a few hours essentially, it's pretty much all gone. And although it will never go down to zero because there will always be half left, after a few hours, you're essentially down to below the level of, radi of background radiation to which we are all exposed anyway. But in the nuclear power industry, the half-life is very important because some of the waste products from nuclear power, we'll come on to these in a future video, some of the waste products have half-lives of thousands of years. So you've got waste material where in thousands of years you'll still have half left. So that of course provides quite a problem for how you're going to store it. In the most part it's of no real use. So disposal of nuclear waste is expensive and problematic. And as I explained a little while ago, some atoms when they decay, decay into atoms which themselves are unstable. And so they further decay. And that decay will carry on until what you find is a stable element or stable isotope that no longer needs to decay. So you can actually have multiple decays going on um, where unstable atoms decay into other unstable atoms. 